It's my pleasure to introduce you to our fifth team talk, Whole Cortex Imaging of Cortical Dynamics. Representing the team is Matt Valley, Doug Alarenshaw, Marav Stern, Kathleen Champion, Kevin and Kevin Takasaki. Your microphone. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Sarah. So good morning, everyone. Um, so we are a team of scientists um, engaged in research activities here at the Allen Institute and at the University of Washington to understand the dynamics of cortical activity um, across the entire mouse cortex. So first I want to say just like a brief note about um, research activities at the Allen Institute. So you know, you've heard these great descriptions of our large, sort of very monolithic, uh, tightly controlled and measured pipelines. Um, but you have to understand that you know, many of the decisions that go to make these pipelines um, were sort of born from smaller research-based activities. Um, and so we're going to show you some data highlights from some of those activities and describe some of the tools um, that, that we've been developing um, that we hope are going to collect data that's going to sort of enrich and also sort of buttress um, some of the ongoing and future pipelines at the Institute. All right, so, so we're very much interested in the representation of activity in the visual cortex, but the visual cortex doesn't act in isolation. Um, if you look at the dorsal surface of the mouse brain, uh, there are many other areas involved in touch and in motion and smell and hearing. Um, and many of these areas are engaged during a behavioral task and can actually feed in information into the visual cortex. So technically, we have a, a two-photon Allen Brain Observatory that makes uh, measurements through a window that's actually implanted uh, to replace the skull of the mouse, and this gives clear optical access so we can see single neurons coding in, in awake mice and, and soon in behaving mice. Um, as, uh, you know, as, as you saw beautifully, I think, from Renata's talk earlier today, uh, there are circuits within the visual cortex that can, you know, the VIP neurons receive all these very long-range projections, for instance, that can collect information from these other areas. And so, especially to understand the coding of, of information during behavior, uh, we believe it's critical to understand the activity of at least some of these other parts of the cortex. So in order to do this, we've actually adopted a surgical technique that I, I believe was pioneered by Tim Murphy at UBC, um, which is to make the skull sort of semi-transparent. Um, it's quite easily done, actually, just by putting uh, an acrylic resin over the intact skull. Um, and through this method, you can actually get optical access to, to much of the dorsal surface of the cortex and many of the, of the brain regions that, that you know, may participate in, in a mouse's behavior. So what does this data look like? This is um, one photon calcium imaging data. Uh, it's somewhat low resolution, um, 6.5 micron pixels, uh, but it's very fast and obviously the field of view is very very large, and that's the, the big advantage of, of these wide field measurements. Oops, let me click on it. You have to see the movie. It's the best part. There we go. This stuff's great. So I, I've, I can look at this. I mean, I've looked at this for so many hours. It, it's a bit like looking at clouds. You're not, you know, you, you can see some clear features. There's activity everywhere. It's highly smoothed, so there are a lot of correlations between adjacent pixels. Uh, there are, you can see wave-like dynamics. Um, you can imagine a lot of rich information here. You, know, you, can, you can imagine the outlines of anatomical areas guiding some of this activity. Um, but of course, we're scientists. We need to understand with a bit more detail than hand-wavy explanations like that. Um, so this team's going to talk about our use of animal behavior to sort of clamp this activity and allow us to parse it better, and of computational techniques and optical techniques to allow us to dive in deeper to, to extract information. So Doug is going to start by um, talking about some, some early be, uh, behavioral results using this technique. Marav will talk about uh, the dimensionality of learning uh, a task. Kathleen will talk about dimensionality reduction techniques. Um, I will talk about uh, some work to separate hemodynamic artifacts from this uh, activity. And then Kevin will talk about a very new technology to actually obtain single cell measurements through the intact skull. Thanks, Matt. I'm Doug Olorensha. Um, and as, 
as Matt said, you know, to, to get to begin to get a handle on this really complex, rich activity that we that we can measure with wide field imaging, we we want to uh, gain tight control of what the animal is actually doing. Um, so most of this, the rest of this talk is actually going to use the the task that you heard about earlier during the visual behavior talk. But we actually started with something simpler, which was just a basic detection task in which animals were trained to respond to a briefly flashed grating stimulus, and we could control the contrast of the stimulus to modulate the difficulty of the task. So it's a very simple task flow where at an unknown time to the animal, there'd be a flash stimulus. They had a short window in which to respond by licking, and if they responded within that window, they would get a water reward. So a simple go, no-go task. Um, and a very basic thing we can do is just look in primary visual cortex and ask what the, what the responses look like. And perhaps unsurprisingly, um, responses in primary visual cortex are modulated by the contrast of the stimulus. So just, just a very basic first, first question, do these, do these signals make sense given the stimuli that we're, that we're delivering? Um, however, there's much more going on than just activity in primary visual cortex. So one thing we can do is uh, use, this, activity, use this, this method, wide field imaging, to look through our traditional five millimeter cranial window, which gives us access to not only primary visual cortex, but surrounding higher visual areas. And what we're looking at here are frames of, uh, of a wide field movie at 100 millisecond intervals. And one thing that's immediately apparent is it's not just activity in primary visual cortex that appears early, it's actually distributed activity across many uh, visual cortical regions. But of course, the power of this method is that we can look at not just visual cortex through our, through our window, but we can actually look at the entire dorsal surface of the, of the cortex, as Matt just described. So another thing that's obvious is that very early on in this process, following the stimulus and before the animal actually responds by licking, there's, there's rich activity across the entire cortical surface. So this, this method really gives us the ability to, to track this activity and try to understand it. So some of the key questions we could ask is can we, can we use this, this data and this method to begin to try to understand which brain areas are involved in, in specific portions or specific epochs during this uh, perception, cognition, action cycle that was, that was introduced earlier during the visual behavior talk. Um, so a, a very basic way of getting at that is to just simply compare conditions. So we can, we can look at movies where the stimulus was presented to the animal and compare those to, to movies where the stimulus was not presented. And this is, this is using a, a, a method uh, just basic signal detection theory metric, um, but you can, you can think of this as how well can you predict whether the stimulus was present or absent based on the activity in that particular pixel in a short window following the onset. And so what we see here is that, again, perhaps unsurprisingly, the, the primary visual cortex um, and some surrounding regions are the best predictors of whether the stimulus was present or not. Um, but we can go a bit further and begin to ask, um, begin to compare now correct responses versus incorrect responses. So trials in which the animal responded to the stimulus versus trials when they did not. And the story here gets a bit more complicated. We have a much more uh, distributed area in which we can, we can actually correctly predict the animal's behavior response prior to the response. Um, and it, it begins to involve more midline and frontal areas. Uh, but another thing that might uh, stand out to you here is we actually see components of vasculature in both of these signals. So something that, uh, that Matt will return to talk to you about and Kathleen as well will be uh, methods for actually pulling apart the hemodynamic activity from the underlying calcium activity. And some additional questions we can ask is do the identified regions or areas, the pixels that we see in these movies, do these correspond to actually anatomically defined regions in the brain? And are these representations static or are they acquired during the learning of the task? So to address this last question, I'll hand it over to Marav. Thank you, Doug. So um, to answer these questions and more, uh, we've extended the time of recordings. So we record over multiple days. And we also switch the task back to the change detection task, where the mouse has to report a change in the grading, in the direction of the grading presented. As you see from the time lapse, over multiple days, the amount of mice that understands and perform the task well is increasing. So in other words, initially the mice are naive and they don't understand the task and eventually they perform it very well. And uh, through this process, we can see how the brain responses, the cortical responses evolve over time. So if we um, look at two pixels that are interesting and in the entire cortex and the, the visual cortex, um, we can pull out the calcium traces from these pixels. So from the first pixel, the entire cortex, in earlier day, um, we pull out all the traces where there was a stimulus 
So there was a change, and the mouse has responded with a lick. And we also pull out all the calcium traces from the same type of trials in late days. So in a late day, and you see the the difference, right? It's extremely obvious. Uh, at the very early on, the responses are very variable, and they change in both magnitude and in height. And in late day, when the mouse is performing well, the responses are very typical and very reliable. Now, this is not obvious. If you look at the visual cortex, um, already in, on an early day, the responses are very typical. Yes, they are more variable with, compared to a later day, but you see that the visual cortex responding strongly to to uh, change. So the stimulus uh, generator uh, response, and it does it reliably already in an early day. We can repeat this um, analysis to all pixels, right? That's the beauty of the, the wide field technique. And we see that um, the visual cortex is indeed responding reliably. So these are significant responses to, sti to stimulus presentation. Um, and the visual cortex is responding reliably already in earlier day. And later on, uh, other cortical area are joining in. These are the motor decision association task and so on. But eventually what's interesting is that the whole cortex is evol involved and the whole cortex is responding reliably to a stimulus presentation. So all cortical areas um, respond. Um, in order to understand better um, the emergence um, of, of the responses here, we, s we moved on and we actually um, build a model. So uh, we build a random neural network that is also performing the task. And the idea of building this network is that it allows us to explore learning in an environment that is purely learning, right? This is a model, so it only includes what we put in it. And we can follow every part uh, of it um, to any um, uh, level that we wish, right? So it's, it's like an open book but while the uh, mouse cortex is obviously a half-closed book, or half-open, depending on how you look at it. So, um, <laughs> in this model, we um, look at the different... We, we build it to include areas that are resembling the cortex, so the, inf the input, the stimulus, comes into a specific part resembling the visual cortex, and there are higher area, frontal areas, that make the decision. And we train it, so we present inputs to it, um, and whether they are the same or different, the target, in other words, the decision, has to report it. So if they are the same, it has to report them as the same, or if they are different, it has to report it as different. And the actual output here you see in black is initially random. However, after a learning epoch, the actual um, output is pretty, you know, pretty good at following the target, you know, what the decision is supposed to be. So as a sanity check, we can pull out the activity of this network, and we see that in an early day, right, this is an early learning epoch, the activity is very variable. And on a later day, the activity is very typical and responding to the presentation of the stimuli. So it's actually resembling uh, the mouse recordings that I've showed you before, and that's a very good sort of sanity check that indeed the phenomena that I've showed you um, in, the, in the mouse cortical activity has to do with learning, the changes has to do with learning have to do with learning. Um, so we move on to characterize the dimensionality of the network. In other words, the number of trajectories that are possible for every unit uh, inside the network to follow. So as the learning progress in the network, and these are three different networks as an example, the dimensionality, the number of possibility that the network has um, decreases to four about four, which is the possibilities of the inputs, right? You can have the first input, the second one, or uh, reversed, or two of them the same, but you have two types of them. So really, it, it converts to the minimal dimensionality uh, possible to um, perform the task well. And this sort of hints of what's happening in the mouse cortex. I mean, in principle, the, the, the mice, they don't have gradual learning. They have better day, they have worse day, you know. They're not as nice. So, <laughs> well, they're nice, but not, not as clean. So you can't lo look at the days, but if you look at the, how well they perform and you plot it um, against the dimensionality of their activity, so you also have to strip the calcium and, and look at the rates, 
um, you actually get the same phenomena, which is basically telling you that the cortical activity dimensionality, the variability in it, is also decreasing as the mice perform the task better, which is, I think, um, yeah, to some level surprising, right? <laughs> as we perform well, we're actually our, our um, activity is more constrained to respond reliably to to the task. Um, and if you're still a bit confused about dimensionality and dimension reduction, then Kathleen would explain it farther. Okay, so a lot of the analysis that Doug and Marav have shown you so far has been pixel-based. So that is uh, the activity in the images, trying to find what's happening in different regions of the cortex is done on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis. Uh, so some of this was through these maps that Doug showed uh, with these response maps. Some of it was Marav showed looking at activity in different pixels and seeing the trace of this activity over time during the task. So you can gain a lot of insight into what goes on in different areas of the cortex by doing this pixel-based analysis, but for the purpose of, anal of analysis, it would be nice to be able to pull out regions that behave in a coherent manner. So this is what I've been trying to do using methods for dimensionality reduction. So Marav introduced this concept of dimensionality reduction, but I'll explain a little more of what we mean by this in this context. So when you think of the full data set of images, we say this is a very high dimensional data set because you have this image that contain, like I've shown on the left here, this full cortex image that contains thousands of pixels and each pixel has some activity that's changing over time. Um, so because each pixel has its own activity, uh, each pixel is considered a dimension. And so you have several thousand dimensions in this data set. However, when you look at something like the movie that Matt showed earlier, you could see that uh, clearly not every pixel was behaving completely independently. You saw a lot of patterns of activity. The activity of certain pixels was related to uh, pixels maybe nearby it. So the idea of dimensionality reduction is essentially to try to find these patterns of activity and use this to rewrite your full high dimensional data set as a weighted sum of some much smaller number of spatial components like these six shown here. So in this example up here, you would take your full data set that exists in many thousand dimensions and reduce it to essentially six dimensions. Uh, so there are many methods for doing a dimensionality reduction. One of the most well known is principal component analysis or PCA. And depending what method you use, these different spatial components here could look like anything. Uh, but for the sake of interpretability, we'd like something that look like these spatial components I've shown here, where you see that each component very nicely um, isolates different regions of cortex. So we found that using a method called non-negative matrix factorization, we get spatial components that look like this. Uh, so you can see that in this like top left corner here, this component contains, it kind of covers most of the cortex. So this is representing some like correlated activity over the whole cortex. But then these other regions here all sort of nicely isolate different regions of the cortex. Um, and these are different things. So some of these are clearly hemodynamic components like these, but then you see some that look maybe more like what you would recognize as anatomical uh, regions. Uh, and importantly, this method doesn't impose any region boundaries, nothing to tell it which regions to pick out. Um, so when you do this non-negative matrix factorization, in addition to finding these spatial components, you also get a time course of activity associated with each component. So now that we have that, we can go back and compare it with this pixel-based activity like Marav showed earlier. So here again is this delta F over F trace of the pixel activity with, of three pixels in different regions of the cortex. Now in this bottom plot, I've pulled out the activity of four components from the non-negative matrix factorization. So in cyan here, you have the correlated activity across the whole cortex, and then the blue, green, and red uh, regions are, or spatial components are associated with the, uh, or these are the traces from the spatial components that contain these blue, green, and red pixels above. Uh, so one thing you'll notice if you compare the traces down here with those up here, is that some of the activity that you see in this pixel activity is pulled into this correlated component. So it's happening across the entire cortex. And then if you look at the activity of these three spatial components here, 
uh, it's suggestive that they might functionally be stimulus, decision, or behavior associated regions. Uh, so now I'm going to hand over to Matt, who will talk more about separating out the hemodynamic uh, activity from the neural activity. Thanks, Kathleen. So computational methods, methods like this to separate signals are very powerful, but often they need experimental validation. Um, as mentioned before, uh, it takes a lot of blood flow to keep the brain running. Um, and when one makes a one photon measurement, uh, the vasculature is often mixed up with the neural signals because we don't have a method to spatially resolve them. This is unlike in two photon uh, measurements where you actually have an optical section uh, intrinsic to the measurement. So we've developed a, a new type of microscope um, that makes a set of additional measurements to our calcium imaging measurement um, so that we can estimate blood flow. I'll bri briefly describe what's happening here. So we have a camera that runs continuously making a calcium imaging measurement, but then we have these, these optical fibers that make what we call a backscatter measurement. Essentially, it shines other colors of light against the brain, and by looking at how uh, those colors of light, which do not interact with the G-CAMP molecule, um, by measuring their change of, in of intensity, we can essentially uh, estimate the concentration of blood that absorbed that light. Um, to do that, we need to build a regression model, um, which I won't get into the details of, but essentially we've made the assumption that um, the signal that we measure is, is uh, in some way the, um, the combination of our calcium signal with the blood flow signals estimated by these additional measurements. And so by, by making these measurements simultaneously, um, we can build, a, uh, build an estimation of both blood flow and calcium and treat them separately. Uh, so in, uh, w one way of validating this sort of approach is actually by looking at a mouse where the only signal is blood flow. A GFP mouse is a great example. There are actually very strong calcium signals or very strong fluorescent signals in a, in a GFP mouse, um, mainly due uh, to changes in blood flow, although there are also some uh, intrinsic signals from intr intrinsic fluorophores. Um, one stereotype signal that you see is in response to a visual stimulus. Uh, there is a neurovascular coupling, which is um, the basis of the bold signal, for instance, in fMRI measurements, um, that causes a dilation of, uh, of, of arteries uh, and an absorption of the light that, you, that excites and is emitted from GFP. Um, and so this shows up as a very stereotyped sag in the, in the fluorescent signal. Um, so our demixing method should be able to uh, eliminate that, which it does in orange, and, and then when mu one makes the same measurement with a calcium response, you see it, it changes the, the time course of that calcium response as well. Um, so to talk about a second new microscope that we've built to sort of enhance our whole cortex measurements is Kevin. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, so as Matt highlighted, the raw wide field signal here uh, is a rich measurement. It's reflecting contributions from hemodynamics and the activity of thousands of neurons um, in each pixel. And uh, my teammates have described um, uh, how we can take these movies and pull out uh, insights into what the cortex is doing on a brain-wide scale uh, during complex behaviors and learning. Now over on the right, <coughs> Um, on a 20 times smaller scale, uh, two-photon imaging through a cranial window lets us image activity of individual neurons and their neighbors, but only <clears throat> within small fields of view restricted to the implant area. And as we've seen from <clears throat> or <clears throat> seen and heard from the team talks today, uh, both levels of analysis help us understand cortical dynamics. And so now I'll describe um, some recent work to try to better understand um, what cortex-wide analysis uh, can reveal about the function of the uh, of the function of the cellular activity, um, specifically by uh, pursuing a method to zoom in through the whole cortex window and look at the activity of individual neurons uh, across the many areas also imaged with wide field. So, uh, what is so difficult about um, zooming in through the whole cortex window? Well, if we look closely at uh, two photo, how a two-photon microscope focuses light into the brain through a cranial window, the essential step is to replace, or mostly or totally replace, the skull with glass. This allows ideal focusing and high localization of fluorescence. However, if we leave the skull intact, like we do um, in the whole cortex window, uh, the focusing light randomly scatters and diffuses by the bone, um, and this leads to 
blurred, blurry, low contrast images, uh, like in this case where we were trying to uh, two photon image uh, superficial dendrites through the uh, through the skull. So fortunately, uh, recent advances in um, recent advances in fluorescent microscopy and in uh, commercial laser technology for three photon imaging. Uh, now let us image at longer wavelengths of infrared light, which penetrate the skull better um, and benefit from a higher order nonlinearity that can recover uh, the lo uh, fluorescence localization and image sharpness. So now with three photon imaging, we can resolve uh, the dendrites um, that we couldn't see here. So uh, when we, uh, with our three photon microscope, uh, when we zoom in through the window of a mouse expressing GCAMP, um, we can separate out activity of individual neurons, and the image quality uh, can be good enough to segment um, somata, nuclei, even some processes. And um, we can uh, take these movies and extract activity traces and look at single cell responses. However, since now we're doing this through the whole cortex window, we can start to ask interesting questions. Uh, we can start to ask interesting questions about uh, how uh, activity patterns and responses on the local cellular level relate to uh, activity analyzed and measured with the wide field imaging. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Matt to conclude. Thanks, Kevin. So we've uh, taught, given sort of a, a couple data highlights and, and described some new tools that allow us to understand better the coding of information um, across a larger field of view. Um, but ultimately, these need to come back and inform our pipelines. So we need to know what are the sort of first order and most interesting areas outside of the visual cortex that can inform our understanding of coding within the visual cortex. And so there are a couple of upcoming pipelines, um, especially the electrophysiology-based pipelines, um, where there are options uh, potentially to make recordings, uh, electrophysiology recordings outside of the visual cortex. And so we hope that some of this information uh, will help guide those decisions in the future. So with that, I would like to um, thank uh, several people at the Allen Institute and external collaborators, um, in particular the, um, the investigators who helped drive these projects, Jack Waters, Sean Oslin, Michael Bison, and Eric Shea Brown. I'm so sorry, Eric, I left you off. Um, it's there? You just kicked me out. Oh, I kicked you off. <laughs> I was looking at you under Allen because you sit right behind me. Um, and, several <laughs> and several external collaborators um, all over the country. And of course, uh, Paul Allen for his support and the rest of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have any questions for the team, please raise your hand. Hi, over here. Uh, I was quite striking by your, you know, um, your imaging showing that uh, the information, or at least uh, uh, the signal, starts in the visual cortex during learning, and then it propagates eventually to the whole brain. And uh, I was wondering if you you know, have any data or any insight as to speak what is going on? You know, I was thinking like maybe what's going on is that the other features of the behavior are also improving over time. Let's say they are walking more or more accurately or whisking or like the eyes are, you know, or maybe the information really starts in the visual cortex in during the whole period and uh, just has faster ways to propagate to other areas by mechanisms, you know, that. So I, I just was wondering, uh, what do you think about that? Sure, that's a great question. I'm gonna let Marav, whose work that was, uh, talk about that. So um, I think the, the answer divided into two. First, you can look into the models for an answer and they will tell you very nicely that what happens is that indeed the information is simply propagating. In other words, the, the connections between the visual cortex and other areas are just strengthened. I, and then you go back into experiments and you can ask, you know, so what, what is happening? And, and from these type of measurements, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have the answer, but I can um, tell you from other recent published papers that they indeed see neurons responding to the task uh, all over the cortex for a different task, and it's not visual, but eventually, um, the, the task is so vital to the, to the mice, right? They want to drink, that the information is, is extremely important. And so the visual cortex in this, in this case, and in other cases, just really um, it, it is, is where the input is coming from, you know, the, the stimulus, the, the information about it is coming from that. I think, I think the, the 
that was the second option that you suggested, that really the information is propagating. And and we see, I mean, because we have wide field, right? So we, in in sense, we're, we're seeing uh, hundreds to thousands, right? Neurons in every pixel about, about hundreds, something like that. Um, um, then, you know, if, if, if there, if some percentage of them is is correlated because the information is coming in, then this is what we're we're picking up in our in the signal, right? So th that's that's what we see. Is that? Yeah, but it, it's a it's a great e a question. I think it's it's probably one of the best you can ask about about this kind of experiments. <laughs> I have a quick question, which may be you know too far in the future, but wh what is really fascinating yet yeah, that that all the areas of the of the cortex after how many days? of training, seven days of training, they start responding to the same thing. Does learning a particular task extremely well actually prevents learning of a another new different task because you have engaged now, I mean, I'm just thinking like, you know, would it prevent you from learning well something using your somatosensory cortex or, you know? <laughs> uh, my, my guess is that our brain is flexible enough, but I don't know, Sean, do you want to help me out here? Uh, <laughs> Of information storage, there is a maximum capacity of information storage for the cortex that's very high, um, and, and I, there are there are psychophysical experiments that show interference between learning different tasks. So that would be interesting to look at. Yeah, yeah. As a model, learned the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're talking to the mathematician here, so. It's like, uh, <laughs> um, I have a, a quick question um, and a comment. Um, We've been doing a similar type of experiments of wide field imaging in uh, learning a, a go no go task. And actually we found that the most important thing to predict the animal's behavior is not the evoked response, but the spontaneous activity. And what the animal's learning over time is to quiet his brain down and put it in the right state to do the task. And you have to look at the spontaneous activity and you'll see that. That You could see it in your data too, I think, that you know the decrease in Invariance is not just in the response, but in the activity before the visual stimulus comes on. And then the other comment about the whole brain being involved, you know, I was I had the fortunate uh, to start in neuroscience in the 70s, and I was studying classical conditioning and rabbits eye blink reflex, and then Eric Kandel was st studying, you know, gill, gill withdrawal and aplasia. And if you imaged it, and they imaged all the neurons, not them, but Larry Cohen, all the neurons in an aplasia during this simple three neuron arc, actually every neuron in the aplasia is active during this uh, thing. And I uh, was recording all over the brain in the 70s and rabbits doing a simple eye blink thing. And then they were, all the brain areas were active, you know. And so I was, why? And I went into the chamber and looked. The, the rabbit's actually moving his face, he's moving his body, he's moving his ears, he's hearing things. You know, the same with the mice, they're whole, it's a whole body, whole organism engagement, even though you're giving a stimulus and say lick, you know. You have to pay attention to the, the whole animal. Thank you. Well, the first note, we're definitely gonna try. Um, and for the second, I mean, we agree, so that's, I mean, that's great. That's great. There was a question here before, right? Um, but it's a disagreement. So I think, you know, there's converging evidence to this point. So I think, yeah, it's great. All right. Let's thank the team one more time.